here every night. You have been delighted and provoked and challenged and stretched and your compassion has been stirred and your intellect stimulated. It's been just a joy and delight to have you with us. So thank you so much for coming. And this evening's lecture is witnessing to a God who acts, implications for mission and ministry in the contemporary church. And I know that you with me will welcome Professor Wilkinson. Thank you, Principal, and uh, thank you indeed for, for having me here. It's, um, and thank you for being here at the end of a long week for you, I guess, is a long week for me, but this has been a real delight. Nice to see you, those of you online. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, I was saying this afternoon that two of my great theological heroes and dear friends and indeed mentors, Kingsley Barrett and Jimmy Dunn, were former Didsbury lecturers. And in fact, I'm rushing off after the lecture this evening back to Durham because we have a memorial service for uh, Professor Dunn and his wife, Mita Dunn, who died during the pandemic. And so we have a memorial service in Durham. Um, and uh, I, I look at this list of scholars and um, it's just a real privilege to be part of it. Let me also thank uh, you for your hospitality and looking after me. Uh, getting me in the right places. I want to particularly thank you to my friend Dennis. We've had breakfast together and he's looked after me in Hartley Victoria College. I appreciate that. And the warmth and indeed stretching nature of the questions that you've asked, most of which I had no idea how to answer, but I appreciate that. Um, and uh, just to say that it, it's wonderful to see a college like this, which takes theology so seriously and is prepared to ask people like me to come and just speculate and think a little bit with you. So thank you for that space and bless you in all of the work that you're doing here, which is very important. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Words that concluded the first edition in 1859 of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. In the second edition, Darwin included uh, into these words, originally breathed by the creator. But that was only in the second edition. It's interesting whether he was pressurized into that, whether he felt under pressure to do it, but it was removed. And the words went back uh, to their original. And in Darwin's view, there is an awesomeness to the physical creation, the biological story of evolution which um, his own response in terms of the physical process is difficult to fully untangle. Colin Russell called Darwin a muddled theist towards the end of his life. He was a very interesting religious person in the sense that his deep love for his wife Emma meant that he rarely spoke uh, uh, about Christianity. He was a lifelong supporter of the South American Missionary Society, uh, contributing financially to it. But a sense in which believing that this process of evolution was breathed by the Creator 
was something that he couldn't sustain. That's clear. But the reasons for that, it seems, had little to do with the evolutionary process itself that he discovered. Far more compelling in Darwin's life were a number of challenges that theistic belief had brought him. Some of them came in his voyage on HMS Beagle from 1831 to 1836. Darwin had joined the crew of the Beagle for its round the world voyage, um, partly to aid the captain of the Beagle collect specimens to support William Paley's design argument. Do you remember that when we talked about it a couple of nights ago? And what happened was, of course, the very famous Galapagos Islands, where he saw finches with different beaks, and he saw tortoises, and he thought to himself, really, does God create all of these different species and puts them on different islands, or surely there's some kind of process which evolves? But that wasn't the only thing that happened on HMS Spiegel. Two other things were really important. One was his encounter with fossils in a gravel bed in Argentina, where he saw laid out before him the waste of previous species that no longer were around. Why would a designer god create animals that were no longer around if he was a perfect designer? And the second thing, which literally shook him, was experiencing an earthquake in Chile. Um, why would a perfect designer allow a world which had earthquakes in it? Now, of course, at that point, Darwin didn't understand um, that the movement of tectonic plates, um, which does cause earthquakes, which is detrimental if you put houses that aren't built properly uh, and put peer, poor people into those houses. Um, but those movements of tectonic plates also gives us agricultural land, which provides the earth with fruitfulness. But nevertheless, he, he thought to himself, why in this perfect system do we get earthquakes? And then something far more profound happened in Darwin's life. In 1851, his daughter Annie died. Annie was uh, dearly loved by her father, and she became ill. He took her to Malvern, uh, where uh, the waters were reputed to have healing effects. He prayed fervently for her healing, and she died. Uh, that's her gravestone in a churchyard in Malvern. And Nick Spencer, I think, rightly said, the last remnants of Darwin's belief in the good, personal, just, living God, loving God of Christianity died at Easter 1851 with his dearly beloved daughter. Darwin came to a conclusion um, and wrote in a letter to Asa Gray in uh, May 1860. Asa Gray was a Harvard paleontologist, um, an evangelical Christian who was very positive about evolution. He was one of the early doctors of Darwinian evolution and proponents of Darwinian evolution. So no problem at all between seeing God work through the process of evolution and be a Bible-believing Christian. But Darwin wrote in 1860 to this evangelical Christian, Asa Gray, uh, there seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designed, created, I'll let you pronounce this type of wasp. Uh, 
with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. What we're dealing with with Charles Darwin is, of course, a human person encountering uh, what all human people encounter. That is the unanswered question of how evil exists if there is a loving God. Darwin had encountered it in lots of different ways. And it's interesting in his autobiography, he said, the more we know of the fixed laws of nature, the more incredible do miracles become. I think, may I just suggest, that perhaps Darwin was adopting a deist Newtonian view of the universe in order to cope with the pain of the evil that he'd experienced both in his own life that he'd seen in the world. That's how it works out in the life of one person. Let me give you a different story. Contemporary to Darwin, um, and this is uh, in the first professor of astronomy at Durham University, a man called Temple Chevalier. Temple Chevalier has a descendant who you've also had as a Didsbury lecturer, a certain N.T. Wright, by the way. Temple Chevalier was professor of mathematics at the University of Durham in 1835. He was appointed to become reader in Hebrew at the same time. He was very disappointed that he wasn't made professor of uh, Christian theology in the university. In fact, he was quite bitter about this. We have a letter from him where he complains that the person who was appointed to be professor of theology, I quote, lacks unction, says Temple Chevalier. That's the way that you, uh, you take a pot shot at fellow members of the faculty. But in 1841, he became professor of astronomy, the first uh, astronomer at Durham University. By the way, he was also registrar of the university for 30 years. He was vicar of Esh Parish Church, uh, just outside Durham. He was rural dean and residentiary canon. He had a full life, to say the least. He'd studied at Cambridge uh, and had read, as Darwin had, William Paley. Um, and what I show there in Esh Parish Church graveyard is the grave of Temple, Temple Chevalier's son, who died at about the same age that Annie Darwin died. Now, there's no evidence here of Chevalier's response to that death in the way that Darwin responded to the death of his daughter. I think part of the problem of evil is that it affects different people in different ways. We know that. People talk about it in different ways. They rationalize it in different ways. They live with pain and hurt in different ways. Chevalier was a different type of religious thinker, theological thinker to Darwin. Uh, Chevalier in uh, his Halcyon lectures, which were delivered in the University of Cambridge, and uh, he had to give 20 lectures rather than just four. Um, Chevalier takes as a model Psalm 19. And in Psalm 19, uh, he gives four lectures on the beginning of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the wonders of God. Um, and he talks about astronomy for four lectures. And he goes, isn't this fantastic? Isn't this wonderful? Let me tell you about just how big the universe is. Let me tell you about uh, how the laws of physics work. Isn't this terrific? Then in his next uh, four lectures, he moves on to talk about the central section of Psalm 19, the law of the Lord. And Chevalier talks about Christian revelation of God's love in Jesus, which he encounters in scripture. 
Then in his next four lectures, he goes to the end of the psalm where he talks about prayer and discipleship, the living out of Christian faith. He's up to lecture 12. At that point, he's run out of material. And so he does what every lecturer does. He gets old sermons and other lectures from here, there, and everywhere, and he shoves them in to fill up the 20 lectures. You've probably noticed that after my first lecture uh, in this. Um, now, I don't want to, to make too much of a point of this, but I do want to, it intrigues me, of um, whether this encounter with the story of Jesus, which was central for Chevalier, was one of the differences to what was uh, true for Darwin. This holding of the scientific worldview in conversation with scripture for Chevalier was very important. And one of the interesting things about Chevalier is that uh, he was one, and I'm sorry about the sexist language, but this was the middle of the 19th century. He was one of the over 700 gentlemen of science who signed a declaration later in the 19th century, a declaration which basically said, we are Christians who are committed to the authority of scripture. We're also uh, people who are professional scientists and we love science. And we want to be committed to both. And even if evolution raises some difficult questions for us, we're not going to um, reduce our confidence in science or in the Bible, even if we can't answer every question. 700 assented to that, of which Temple Chevalier was one of them. This sense of the role of holding science and scripture in conversation, in dialogue, seems to me at the heart of at least holding us in the midst of a world which is both wow and ugh, of both beauty and ugliness, of love and justice and hatred and injustice, both in human relationships but also in terms of the natural world. This sense of how you begin to think about God's action in the world when there are many difficult things, the problem of evil, of course wasn't new to Chevalier or to Darwin. On the 1st of November, 1755, an earthquake, tsunami, and fire hit the city of Lisbon. Uh, it killed uh, estimates between 6% to 30% of the population of Lisbon. Not only was the death toll huge, but it also provoked theological uh, struggle because in this devout Roman Catholic city, the tsunami and earthquake destroyed most of the city's 40 churches and 90 convents, but left standing most of the brothels. The scale of the disaster for Lisbon was matched by the profundity of its effect on 18th century thought. In philosophy, literature, and science, Existing models of the relationship between human beings, the natural world, and God were brought into question by this cataclysmic event. And certain new, more naturalistic, less theological perspectives were brought to bear. Uh, Immanuel Kant and others had been thinking about seismology. Philosophy, interesting enough, started to talk about firm grounding or shaky foundations. And theologians got into the act, often pointing the finger of accusation. Some Roman Catholic commentators pointed out that the people of Lisbon uh, 
Lisbon weren't very good Roman Catholics. While some Protestants pointed out that the residents of, of Lisbon were all Roman Catholics. Religious people are pretty good at dailing out the blame from time to time. But it also led to um, some deeper theological questions. Was there a natural or supernatural explanation? What was God doing? Voltaire said, this is not the best of all possible worlds. We live in a capricious and cruel world. Rousseau made a point about, actually, we shouldn't live in cities. This is the evils of progress. We should all reject progress. But fundamentally was the question, was God absent in this? Or was God cruel? Was God acting in a vindictive judgment way through the physical process? Or was this beyond his control? Uh, it caused John Wesley to write a book called Serious Thoughts Occasioned by the Late Earthquake of Lisbon. Great title for a series of Didbury's lectures, perhaps. Serious Thoughts. And Wesley um, uh, speculated about a number of things as part of a number of sermons, journal articles, and hymns and I'll come back to hymns, by the way, in just a moment. Um, Wesley talked about, was this judgment on uh, people who needed to be punished? This wasn't unusual in the time of Wesley. His brother Charles had published a series of earthquake hymns uh, in 1750. I don't know if you have ever know this, uh, that, uh, I mean, I have to say, they're not terribly good hymns. Can I say that as a Methodist? I mean, Charles Wesley wrote some real belters. He also wrote some really terrible ones as well. Uh, these are not some of his best, it happens to say. Um, but these were occasioned not by the Lisbon earthquake, which would happen in five years' time, but by a series of earthquakes in and around London, uh, they'd given rise to some scientific speculation, uh, whether the earthquakes were purely natural phenomena, subterranean air, water, or fire. Um, but Randy Maddox, uh, in assessing this material from the Wesley brothers, points out a number of things. Um, the Wesleys were trying to hold on to how earthquake storms and epidemics were more than just, just accidents of nature. They didn't want to negate God's action, to say God was absent in all of this. That led them sometimes to say that this was God uh, punishing or protecting. It certainly, in the hymns, was a chance for Charles to talk about the need for repentance, for people to awake, repent, and believe the gospel. But also there was this sense of the world not quite right as it was. And the ability to, to use these events to point forward to say, the world is not in its finished perfect state. There is something more to come. Karen Vesterville Tucker, uh, another Methodist uh, scholar in the States, um, gifted liturgist and historian of liturgy, uh, says that this supplementing authorized liturgical resources in times of national crisis was something that was often done. Uh, hymns and liturgies gave a take on the questions of the day, not just the, not, the, not just the pamphlets and the books, but actually in liturgy. And they explored questions of the nature of God and the nature of humanity. And as Karen says, they pointed to a new creation. They heralded that the ruined world, uh, taken from Psalm 46, is giving way to a new created earth. Now what we've got here is the Wesleys struggling with 
cataclysmic physical events around them and trying to say, what sense can we make of this? Um, they didn't want to say, God simply has given up on the world completely. Uh, nature is the art of God. It's God acting upon the created world, was what Wesley would say. They were struggling with why evil happens. They were thinking that at moments there were indications of judgment, but there was also this um, straining, groaning in creation itself, to use the imagery of Romans 8, to say there is something more. Creation itself inherently points us to that which is to come. But I'm fascinated that this should be the stuff of liturgy and song. Um, I go to a church where um, if, uh, if we sing something that is more than about six months old, it's a hymn. It's not a contemporary song. And I love some of the contemporary songs. Really wonderful. I don't see a lot in, in contemporary music uh, really struggling with some of these big questions. And they are a struggle in Wesley's hymns. I'll come back to that. Um, Darwin, Temple Chevalier, the Earthquakes, and the Wesley Brothers. Let me go to something a little more immediate. And that is our experience of some of these questions during uh, a period of time which has been like no other in most of our living memories. And that's how we experienced the pandemic together, where science and our understanding of the natural world was paraded almost every night um, on either side of Boris Johnson. Chris Whitty, next slide, please. Do you remember that? As we went through Patrick Valance and others. And we heard phrases uh, such as, we are going to be led by the science. Um, uh, and our understanding in churches as we try to uh, struggle with issues of health and safety was at times all consuming. You know, which surfaces do we have to clean? What do the scientists tell us? And science within the pandemic um, uh, was very difficult to really understand because science is not a monolith. So the epidemiologists were saying lockdown is the way forward. Those who are concerned with the science of, of mental well-being were saying actually isolating people from each other was not good to do. And then even the epidemiologists uh, had different views in terms of herd immunity or let the virus rip or not. Um, and the science changed. I mean, as a college, I don't know what it was like here, we put huge resources into cleaning of surfaces. Actually, it turned out that it was ventilation that was the really key issue as we went on. So the pandemic showed us a lot about understanding the nature of the provisionality of science. If you were here last night, um, the limited nature of scientific theory. But it also talked a lot about theology. Um, as I uh, went for my walks during uh, lockdown, uh, I used to listen to a podcast with um, Fee Glover and Jane Garvey, two great uh, female broadcasters of the BBC. They've just left the BBC and gone off to one of the other stations. Uh, but during the pandemic, they interviewed the Australian comedian and songwriter, Tim Minchin. Tim Minchin is a, an atheist, and this is just a small section of that podcast, as Fee and Jane talk to Tim Minchin about religion. And my activism has focused on where religion meets 
prejudice and mm. uh, particularly um, religious privilege. I'm not a person of faith either of any of any faith, and I would imagine this year has this year has presented quite a challenge to people of faith. We're not really hearing a lot about that. Um, maybe I'm just moving in the wrong circles. Can I can I ask you something though, Jane? If you had uh, if you had heard more from religious leaders of any faith and somebody, what, what would it, that they, what, what would they have been able to say that would have made you sit up and take notice if you're not a person of faith anyway? You're, that's a, you raise a good point. Um, yes. Why would I be interested? But I'm, I'm just, I'm conscious that they've just haven't, to my mind, they've been peculiarly absent and by the way that's not to say that there aren't people of faith going round and about doing wonderful works to help um, the very vulnerable I'm sure they all are it's hard to get column inches when you're sort of saying why don't we just be kind to each other or you know <laughs> well no I suppose what I'm after is an explanation why has God let this happen plague. yeah I mean it? there are radicals who think it's part of the end times but the most most gentle English religious people don't really have that much of a literal no. they don't no. explain cars by god or they god just sits as a, a nice hymn in the background of their lives which i mm. completely respect god just sits as a nice hymn in the background of their lives now i mean as i was walking i was struck by that and something of anger bubbled up inside me and said well well i mean We've been talking about this every week online, and certain people are coming to our church for the first time online uh, who wouldn't have come in person. And, but it's interesting that um, for those three folk who were outside the church, what was the church saying about the pandemic? Um, during the pandemic, we uh, held a conference. We do a number of conferences at Durham as part of our Equipping Christian Leadership in an Age of Science project. And we held an online conference uh, talking about viral science and public theology. A number of uh, senior church leaders, bishops, theological college leaders, um, people from different denominations. Um, and we had two guests to come and speak to us. One was a leading politician. Um, he paid tribute to the work of the churches during the pandemic in looking after the needy, in providing food banks, and uh, was so, he wasn't a Christian, but was so thankful for the work of the churches during the pandemic. But then we had a senior news executive then from um, a, a major um, media corporation, which begins with the word B, and he uh, came and he said, he said, he said, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a person of faith. But what has surprised me during the pandemic is I haven't heard virtually anything from church leaders. He said, in a time when a society needs people to talk about grief, compassion, and hope, I just haven't heard it. Now, I could see on the Zoom screen the reaction of a number of, of church leaders to it. It was kind of... You know, if it was a cartoon, you could see them getting redder and redder and the head was going to explode in a moment. But actually, um, why was that? Was it because most of our communication had turned internal onto um, meeting together on Facebook on a Sunday morning? Uh, was it that we'd lost confidence about speaking to the public square? Was it that actually we didn't have anything to say because... We couldn't understand what was going on theologically on this. Well, uh, we thought we'd do some research on this, and uh, my colleague at Durham, Dr. Toko Kamwendo, went to interview 12 bishops uh, about their views on the pandemic. Should I tell you what they said? <laughs> oh, obviously not attributed to it. Well, I'm using Toko's work here. Um, uh, uh, she discovered the most consistently mentioned unhelpful narratives all hinged on an understanding of the pandemic as an act of God. Seems part of why we didn't want to speak publicly was we didn't want to speak about what God was doing. I can understand that because it's a very difficult uh, question. 
So she then pushed and said, why? Well, it was interesting that a number of them um, talked about how during their time of theological training, they uh, had uh, been shaped to resist interventionist theologies. That was talked about quite a lot. The kind of fitful, uh, capricious intervention of God in the natural world. The, uh, their theological formation had, that had been central to it, and so they didn't want to talk about it. Secondly, uh, they talked about the fraught history of Christian commentators interpreting natural disasters as divine action, including the Wesley brothers. Uh, but also, uh, do you remember Christian comments from certain churches in the US when New Orleans was hit by um, um, hurricane and tidal waves? They talked about how they needed to maintain a space for the pandemic, the suffering and the virus that caused it to be understood as part of creation. That's interesting. They didn't want to attribute the virus as part of creation. Uh, they wanted to maintain a focus on human, human agency and responsibility as the most appropriate response to the pandemic. I've got sympathy with that. And finally, um, they wanted to resist the punishment narrative as it left crucial questions such as punishment for who and for what sin is best understood as a way of rendering what is a blunt ethical instrument less viable. Now, in such a distinguished theological grouping as this, we'd want to resist punishment narratives. And yet the danger is, and I'd want to resist them, but the danger is, um, what do we then leave a picture of God in that? That God isn't involved? What is God doing in this? Think back to some of the models of providence that we talked about. Can God, God, can God do things? Does he use, use human agents? What could God do? Now, the answer to all of these questions, my friends, from me at least is I don't know. I was once on a local radio interview and the interviewer said to me at the end of talking about science and religion, she said, David, we've got 30 seconds before the news. She said, um, what's your view on earthquakes, famine, uh, epidemics, uh, war and violence? Leaving me 25 seconds to say something. And at that point, I just have to say, I don't know. But sometimes actually saying we don't know is not a bad thing. Why is it in public at times Christians feel that they either have to be silent or give trite answers to some of these questions? It's all right. Um, to say with William Young Fullerton, I cannot tell, da 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 da, but this I know. And so I'm going to move from not giving an answer to the problem of evil, and I'm sorry you may want to leave now because if, if that's what you came for, I'm going to disappoint you, to say, how do we live as church and Christian? theologians and leaders in the midst of all of this. Let me suggest um, that the church provides a very important community within, in, within these unanswered questions, which aren't just for Christians. So let me suggest this first. The church is a community for living with unanswered questions and with pain. The heart of what the church should be about is the ability to ask questions and not always have easy answers. And I say that, my friends, as a Bible-believing, convinced evangelical Christian 
But it seems to me that the nature of the church and the nature of the biblical witness is the pain of living with unanswered questions. And so, what's the place of lament within our worship? Tom Wright and others picked this up early in the pandemic. What does it mean to lament the nature of the world and our experience? What does it mean for the church to be a place of longing, which longs for something better? As a teenager, I was taken with you 2 song, Sunday, Bloody Sunday. How long, how long must we sing this song? Reflecting some of the psalmist language. Lord, how long? Um, I think that's where the church should be. And what about the church as a place of anger? Why, Lord? Lord, what are you doing in this? And our church is a place where that kind of anger, which we find when we read the Psalms, often very politely. I, I mean, I, I work in an Anglican college. It's wonderful when we read the Psalms. We do so in hushed tones in morning prayer. You know, and some of the Psalms are going, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Have we got churches which are places of anger, expressions of anger? And what about our songs and liturgy in this, in the midst of all of this? Oh, I know, I mean, it's great to have churches which, in the midst of the pandemic, talked about the faithfulness of God and the love of God and the, you know, let's celebrate who God is. Wonderful, absolutely. The Psalms do do that, but they often need to get there through asking the difficult questions. And the faith in the Lord isn't the easy answer. It's the response to the difficult questions. And what about a church as a place of patience? Um, a community which holds patiently um, where there is no easy answer but doesn't rush to quick answer. Do you see what I'm trying to say in this? Um, the picture that I've shown you here, um, I find a very moving picture. Um, in Durham University, when you retire as the vice chancellor of the university, the tradition is that an artist um, uh, paints you in your academic robes sitting in front of one of the departments of the university. And so we have a whole series of um, portraits of vice chancellors um, sitting in their academic robes. This is the vice chancellor of Durham University when he retired last summer. He had a portrait painted wearing a mask uh, with his dogs and his wife because for two years he exercised leadership, wearing a mask and mostly in Zoom meetings from home. And he said this was the most challenging and most fulfilling time that he'd ever had as a leader. And he wanted the university to remember the significance of the pandemic and what we'd lived through together. And all of the feelings of uncertainty and difficulty. And I, I just feel, I, I, is it just me? Or in our relief to be through the pandemic, we've actually wanted to forget it. And that's why memorial services for people who died during the pandemic, I think, are so important. Uh, with living with the pain and the anger the lament of all of that. So in the midst of these issues of unanswered questions and the problem of evil, part of our witness, I think, is to be a community for living with unanswered questions and pain. The second point, I always get into time problems with this. The second is the church needs to be a community to resist unhelpful narratives. Narratives. 
Donald Trump famously, my illness is a blessing from God. Well, yeah, I mean, he may believe that. But what does it mean to resist unhelpful narratives that paint the wrong picture of God? Because you can easily transfer that from one person's statement to a general rule. Uh, you know, John Hick, that this world is a veil of soul making. It's difficult because it's about making us better people. And so all of the challenges that we face are there to make us better people. Well, if you're living through it, you can say that, but I'm not going to patronize you by saying that, particularly if we in the pulpit say that to people who are really, really hurting. The excessive nature of human suffering. Um, another piece of research we did during the pandemic was done my, by my colleague, Dr. Francisca Colt. Uh, early in the pandemic, Fran uh, identified a deep-seated narrative that was running through both the language and stories of politicians and religious leaders. And it was the narrative that we were at war with the virus. Do you remember this? Boris Johnson, we are going to pummel the virus into submission. We are going to have to be victorious over the, over the virus. Occasionally, as numbers went up, he would say, well, this is the natural world making us humble. But, but often then the vaccine came along, we're going to triumph over the vaccine. Now, of course, when a society is faced with existential threat, one of the ways that leaders get a society together is to paint the other as the enemy. So I can understand why this happened. But the trouble with this narrative is it begins to have a life of its own. So people working in situations where they don't have enough PPE are characterized as heroes. They're thrown over the top of the trench to go and do the work, even though we're not supporting them in the right way. But also, you see, this thing about triumphing over the virus, what does that say about our doctrine of creation? What does it say about putting human beings and the rest of the created order in conflict. What Fran uh, argued in a series of papers is that they, politicians and some religious leaders built a conflict narrative of ourselves and the rest of creation. And if you know anything about the origin of the environmental crisis, you'll know that this comes from a distinction in part between ourselves as lords and masters of creation and creation being the thing that we can do with as we want. And I had a wonderful section on Lynn White in uh, 1967, but I'm running out of time, so that'll have to wait um, for later. In fact, a Christian doctrine of creation, I think, is not about a conflict with creation, but is to see ourselves as part of creation and a humility about creation. Edward Jenner, discoverer of the smallpox virus, um, talked about how medicine for him was serving human beings, but he wrote, while the vaccine discovery was progressive, the joy I felt at the prospect before me of being the instrument destined to take away from the world one of its greatest calamities was often so excessive that in pursuing my favorite subject amongst the meadows, I've sometimes found myself in a kind of reverie. It's pleasant for me to recollect that these reflections always ended in devout acknowledgments to that being from whom this and all other mercies flowed. Jenner was not just a medic, he was also a naturalist. He delighted in creation rather than seeing it as an enemy to be overcome. He wanted to bring healing, but he saw himself as part of it. <clears throat> 
Um, I think I'm up to three, am I? Yeah. Deidre, I am going over time. I have five more minutes, is that all right? Or so, well, five more minutes is a bit of an ex uh, exaggeration. Third, I think in witnessing to these things, we need to be a community that engages science. And so, um, seeing science as gift, it's really interesting that some vaccine hesitancy was motivated by religious groups and religious arguments. Partly because we didn't see science as a gift from God. However, I think we're a community that needs to engage science uh, without being led or dominated by the science. I hope if you were here all through these lectures, you'll see that I've pointed out the danger of science becoming the only and dominant voice in this. I think there is a danger of seeing science as the only savior. And we need to, um, to engage with science in different kind of way. I think we need to see um, uncertainty. As I talked about in the previous two lectures, um, part of our experience of the natural world allows us to recognize uh, pointing to new creation. But one of the things I wanted to pick up, partly because we were talking about it over tea, was engaging science is churches seeing science as vocation. Now, I'm sure you don't go to churches where occasionally I see something like this happen. A young person says, I feel the Lord's leading me to Bible school or college. The church goes wonderful. Come to the front. Let's lay hands on you. Here's a big check to help you with those fees to study theology. Round of applause for this young person who's been called by God. But if a young person in the back row says, I want to go to university to study biochemistry, how many churches say, come to the front. Let's lay hands on you. Here's a big check to help you with your expenses. And let's rejoice in what wonderful calling is a vocation to be a scientist that you've got. I think a community that engages science by seeing science as vocation and affirms the work of Christian disciples who are scientists and technologists in the pew or the comfortable seats is a community that witnesses to a God who's active both in the laws of physics and gives us the gift of using those for the good of others and in the God who we can pray to for miracles. Um, James Simpson, the, um, uh, uh, the um, person who discovered antiseptic treatment, uh, he says, at a, at a, you probably won't be able to read this, so let me read it for you. At a commencement address for medics at Edinburgh University, he said, as we medics, if we had nothing but pecuniary rewards and wealthy, worldly honors to look at, our profession would not be one to be desired. But in its practice, you will find it to be attended with peculiar privileges, second to none in intense interest and pure pleasures. It is our proud office to tend the fleshy tabernacle of the immortal spirit, and our path rightly followed will be guided by unfettered truth and love unfeigned. In the pursuit of this noble and holy calling, I wish you all God's speed. Sense of vocation. I'm nearly there. Two last points. We witness in the midst of all of this by being a community of cross and resurrection. We talked about the resurrection last night as it points towards new creation, that which is to come, the physicality of new creation. But resurrection has to go through Calvary. There is a God who dies on a cross, who stands with us in the mess, where our calling, following the path of Jesus, is to do the dying, 
in the hope that the God of resurrection will raise us. That's the path of discipleship. That's the witness. I don't find in the cross an answer to the problem of evil. What I find is a God who stands with me in the problem of evil and injustice. And the final thing, and I'm rushing through, I'm really sorry, um, is uh, we witness by being a community of openness to grace. Um, I became a Christian and one of the first books I read was Power Evangelism by John Wimber. Some of you remember that? Wimber used to tell the story when he became a Christian. Uh, before he went to church, he read the New Testament and he thought, wow, isn't it going to be amazing at church on Sunday morning? People are going to be healed. People are going to be cast out demons. What a wonderful, exciting place it's going to be. And then he went to church. Wimber, in his own ministry, I think, um, wanted to ask the question, what does it mean to be open to surprising grace? The practice of praying for healing, the practice of being open to the leading of the Spirit, the openness which would see most extraordinary things done which you can't quite rationally understand, and yet experiencing God in the midst of the pain. And so when David Watson contracted cancer, uh, it was Wimber who sat with David Watson and talked with the fact that actually David Watson needed to get ready to die. There was a reality to, to grace that John Wimber saw both in the experience of healing and in experience of being with the Lord in death. An openness to grace, I think, means that the church witnesses to the action of God by um, hesitant yet confident prayer, which says, Lord, may your will be done, and let's be open to see what God is doing. I think we witness by being a community of grace, by being honest with one another when prayers aren't answered, not simply explaining them away, but actually saying, we prayed, but that person wasn't healed. And I think we point, not just to grace in a general theological sense, we point to the one who embodies grace. For in my own struggle with the problem of evil, it's only Jesus who holds me in the midst of all of this. Why do I believe in a God of love even when I can't answer all of the questions? Because I see grace embodied in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Gosh, I've gone on for an hour, and I've only got through half of the material I prepared. I'm really sorry. I need to stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure there are questions, and so we're going to open the floor to questions for a few minutes, knowing that you do have to rush off the to the train. train. Yeah, right. I'll monitor that. I'm sure also that there may be some online and Tim, I think, is watching that space for us. Thank you, Dr. Noble. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for uh, this evening's, uh, again, stimulating and thought-provoking uh, lecture. Um, in the far distant past, when I was a student, uh, the great textbook on theodicy was John Hicks' yes. Evil and the God of Love, which yes. in many ways was a splendid uh, yes. bringing yes. together. But I was uh, struck in more recent years when I read David Bentley Hart's The Gates of the Sea, mm -hmm. written in response to the tsunami in the yes, Indian Ocean, yes, yes. when uh, he pointed out that um, Voltaire's mockery mm. of Leibniz and um, uh, the best of all possible worlds yes, yes. was actually a deist criticizing a deist. Yes, yes. And his point was yes, that uh, yes. 
the deists can wrestle with theodicy, but actually it's not really part of Christian theology at all. Yes. Have you been saying the same thing? Far more or less eloquently than either you or David Bentley Hart. Yes, I have. Um, I think the problem of theodicy for the deist is severe um, and doesn't have the resources that Christian theology um, gives us. Now, that, to say that it has more um, resources is not to say it has easy answers, of course. Um, but at the heart of, of a truly Christian view is a God who dies on a cross. Um, and that is the integrating moment in a Christian response because um, not only does it show us solidarity, it also shows us the power of redemptive love in the midst of the most horrendous of circumstances. And I think uh, the reason I, I want to keep saying I don't know the answer to the problem of evil is because I don't think that theodicy is a theological conundrum which can be solved because part of what you've said, it's set up uh, in a peculiar way. And so the flow from Newtonian predictability through deism, through the design argument into theodicy, and is an interesting you know, if we go back to David Hume, uh, we talked about his critique of miracles, his critique of the design argument is exactly the problem of evil linked into that. And the, the Christian way of talking about this is not to simply fall into that pattern. It's to say we're starting with a different kind of conversation here. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> And I think part of this is, is particularly in, in the Christian pastor's need to try and say something in the midst of suffering and to try and give an intellectual response rather than holding the hand and crying with the person in pain. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions? Um, thank you for the lectures over the past four days. Thank you. Um, they've been very thought-provoking. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, do you not see a beauty in the tension between the two things? Uh, the both, as Isaiah says, that God creates calamity, but we mm. also see in, uh, in the Old Testament that God declares that he is a loving God yes. and full of mercy. Yes. Yes. That to some extent, Though it's a yeah. difficult answer, the answer of Job of yeah. the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, yeah. Um, yeah. is kind of a unity between the tension of the two. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful point. And I think within the biblical witness, there is that tension. And part of the messiness of the discussion of God's act, you've drawn attention to beautifully in that sense. And therefore... Um, I don't want, and I think the, what the Wesleys were struggling with was exactly that. They were not wanting to um, go to the deist view. They were wanting to say uh, the biblical witness drives us to holding some tension. And the biblical witness it, it is often a caution against too simplistic movement to one extreme or the other. Now, I still, I still struggle with, uh, and, and it is a struggle for me, with some of the biblical passages about punishment and judgment um, and some of the Old Testament stories. And partly it's a reflection of also the, the, the struggle that I have with John Hick, which is about excessive suffering and unjust excessive suffering. I don't think it goes anywhere near been able to talk about that. And I read scripture, you know, I try and read the Bible uh, through every year. Um, and I know there are parts where I'm thinking in the morning, I, I don't want to read this this morning. <laughs> um, 
But it, those stories have a questioning way of doing this. And this is where I think Anglican liturgy, if I may say so, is to be commended mm. because of its deep commitment to reading scripture and reading those really difficult parts of scripture. Um, and, um, and there's something about sitting under those stories and seeing some of these tensions and being informed by them to stop going to a very easy philosophical model mm. either side. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Thank you. Any last question? Oh, Tim there. Oh, two. Go on then. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Anya. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I come from um, America yeah. And as I was growing up, there was always this tension of, in church, like science versus the church. Yes. And yeah. um, in these days, and in particular post-pandemic, what are some, and this might be for another seminar, practical ways that the church can perhaps not take science back, if you will, but um, hold them as, as friends and companions yeah. together? Thank you. That's a very important question. And I think... The experience in the US is particularly important in this mm. because part of, the, um, part of the, the tension between science and Christian faith was part of the culture wars in the early 20th century um, where more was at stake than just science and the Bible. It was really who was in authority within culture. We had some of that within the British system perhaps not as, as much. And that's why I think that six-day creationism grew rapidly in the early part of the 20th century within the US situation. Because this wasn't just about evolution, this was about who, was, who had the right in education, in public life, to be an authority. So I think, first of all, your point is really important about I think we need to start by understanding our context and our history. So I talked a little bit about, in the first lecture, about the way that Christian faith um, contributed to the growth of science. And so when Lawrence Krauss or Richard Dawkins say, what has theology ever done for us? Part of the answer is, it allowed you to do the science that you do day by day. Hmm. Now, that's not a trite answer. That's actually also saying to the church that science is um, part of our history, part of the richness of that. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is about vocation, this sense of the affirming of the vocation of the disciple of Jesus who lives as a teacher of science, uh, a researcher, a technologist or an engineer? Mm -hmm. How do we do that in local churches? How do we pray mm -hmm. for the person who is making difficult decisions in the lab mm -hmm. as well as for the missionary overseas? Mm -hmm. And I think liturgy has a particular part to play in that. Um, one of the old hymns that we sing in our church um, is, <laughs> is a hill song, um, song called uh, So Will I which is, for those of you who don't know, one or two of you do know that song, um, talks about the billions of stars and species evolving and science as a gift from God. And when we first song, sang that song a number of years ago, um, I was sitting beside a student and tears were rolling down this student's face. And so after the service, I said, uh, you know, didn't, has the Lord touched you? you know, mm. uh, the Lord, Lord's interested in the one. Are you the one? Which is how the song ends. She said, no, not really. Uh, uh, I said, uh, uh, the thing is, I've never heard biology and evolution in a song. And I do biology mm. and evolution. Mm. Now, that's something about affirmation in liturgy. So affirming not just by, by saying, but also embodying it in liturgy. I think the third thing is to celebrate uh, those people who um, embody at the senior level mm. 
Christian commitment and scientific excellence. So Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Program and mm. um, Obama's science advisor, wonderful biblically based Christian. Um, my own development as a young scientist and Christian I, I, I was because of people like Professor Robert Boyd, Sir John Horton, um, others in what was the old Research Scientist Christian Fellowship, who were people who spoke of faith and spoke of their science with integrity. So role models are very important. There's one other thing. And that's the ability to enjoy science and enjoy creation. That's what I was trying to get with Edward Jenner quote, which I rushed really quickly. But that delight in creation, enjoying mm. science, enjoying mm. the things. So, I mean, read Richard Dawkins on, um, on the evolutionary picture and get something of his joy. Don't worry too much about his theology. I mean, that can be dealt with really easily. <laughs> but don't let the theology stay in, get in the way of enjoying science. Mm. Uh, again, one of our projects in Durham has been to work with Messy Church, you've come across Messy Church. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we helped them do a book, D uh, Dave Gregory, wonderful Baptist minister, uh, a book called um, uh, uh, Messy Science. Cool. 101 science experiments to do in church. Uh, blowing things up. I love it. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've helped cathedrals bring, um, bring <laughs> Dippy the dinosaur into the nave of the cathedral. <laughs> so that science is in the... I mean, just enjoy it. Don't see it as threat. Um, and so I think part of this fun delight in God's creation helps a little bit to re redeem our view of science, perhaps. I think we have one last question. It's quite too. a long one if we have oh, yeah, time. Great. I, I, well, I've quite been giving very run. long answers. <laughs> yeah. okay, so that's on. fine. Uh, it's from Dave Lunn online. Yeah. Uh, in John Wesley's writings, yeah. he emphasized that due to humanity's limits, it cannot know the answer to why God allows evil to occur. Yep. Yet this did not stop Wesley from, in the same sermon, speculating, so, speculating on reasons for evil, yeah. especially physical evil. Would you say Wesley was wasting his time with his speculation, and should he have been content in his ignorance? Put another way, is, I don't know meant to be the conclusion of the problem of evil conversation or a commencing qualifier and expectations in the conversation. Yeah, I, I remember Dave's question from the other <laughs> night, which was as good as that one. Um, and I said the other night that he summed up my lecture in a short paragraph and he's done it exactly the same thing again. I think that's a wonderful way to put it, that it, it begins the conversation um, rather than stops the conversation. So that, um, I don't know, but let's just have a cup of coffee together. Let's sit together for a little while. Let's talk about this. Well, there's this way of looking at it and this way of looking at it. There's these tensions in Scripture. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there's also, I also think that theology has a playfulness to it in the right context. Now, the trouble is we often have this playfulness in the, in the wrong context, in the pastoral situation. But one of the wonders of a theological college is to play with some of these theological speculations. To do so in the midst of Christian questioning and fellowship and um, uh, being kind to each other in the conversation. But actually to keep asking questions, to give your principal and your lecturers a really hard time um, to, because at the, at the core of both science and theology for me is actually at the end of the day not easy answers, it's recognizing the questions. So if I don't know then follows on to this is an interesting question. I think that's really helpful. Now I, 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 I think that Charles in his hymns was partly playing with a few questions. And we all have different mediums through which to do it. If you're an artist, you play with questions. If you're a musician, you play with questions. If you're a comedian, 
you play with questions. If you're a theologian, you play with questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and for modeling an openness of grace to us, I think. So thank you so much for these lectures. And I've been asked as well, as well as thanking our good friend, um, to announce next year's lectures, which are coming up quickly because they're much earlier in the year. So it's in October still, but October the 9th to the 12th next year. And these ones are entitled Jesus in the Cartographic Perspective, Mapping Christian Practice, Thinking and Feeling. And it's Professor Amos Young who's giving those lectures for us next year. So we're looking forward to that, I know. But in the meantime, you're welcome to come and join us for coffee and biscuits next door or other refreshments. And thank you once again for giving of yourself to us in this way. Appreciate it.